Now, I was never very... Tony Griffin, sorry, I beg your pardon. You're all right. I've been called worse. Um, I was never that comfortable behind a podium, so if it's okay with you, I'm going to come down here, if, if this reaches. Lovely. Now, how are you all doing? Great. So, it's great to be here. You're very lucky I'm here, because my flight didn't go this morning, or maybe I'm lucky that I'm here, because it is a huge honour. And I know I'm a young man, and I haven't lived through many of the life's ups and downs that many of our audience has, so I'm very grateful to have been asked to have been here. Um, I was lucky enough to be here because I got a lift, and I got a lift with uh, a wonderful person, and we had a lovely chat, but I slept for the first two hours, so I missed all the motorway, and I woke up as we got into this small rose of Donegal, and I was just blown away by the scenery. And don't we live in one beautiful, special country? And as I, as I was waking up and enjoying the scenery, it reminded me so clearly of a day, very early morning really, when I was a young boy, I was probably 12, and I came down to go to the bathroom. There's seven in our family, so if you really were looking to get to the bathroom, you got up early. And on this particular morning, I was up and I wandered down, and, and I remember looking over and seeing my father, and thanks Yvonne for mentioning my father. We were very, very close, and I don't know why, but... I asked him a question. He was sitting at the kitchen table looking across the, the road at a field where there was cows um, grazing. Jack Nealon's farm was the man who owned that farm. And I remember, and I, again, I don't know why I asked him, but I said to him, do you like your job, Daddy? And he paused, and it was one of the, as I recall, one of the rare moments of real, real honesty where he spoke to me almost as his peer, not his son. He said, no, I hate it. And I said to him, why do you do so? And he said, for you and your brothers and sisters. And the reason I tell you that very private story is because it, to me, exemplifies love. And what I'm here to do to talk to you about tonight is exactly that, love. But it's love for our young people and in their infinite potential. So that's what I'd like to cover. Um, when I sat down to prepare this, I said, who am I to be the historian or the sociologist and look backwards and give my opinion on, on why I think we are where we are. And then I said, who am I not to? And one of the things I thought about was, we Irish are a passionate people. We're a hard people. But whether it was colonialization driving or hurling up into the mountains and our education into hedgerows, or whether it was years of silence and secrecy, where a doctrine was used, where fear was used to spread a message of love started by some fellow we never even met or knew where he came from in a place called Nazareth, a fellow with long hair, or whatever the God or the Jesus that brought love into the world. It's real, isn't it? We've all felt it. But somewhere along the line, we lost that as a people. And our spirit was broken. And we're a heart-centered people. Let me talk about our education for a minute. I'll bring you through SOAR in a minute and how it came about and what we're doing. But firstly, my sense of our education is we inherited an industrial revolution's approach to education. Create worker ads to fulfill a bottom line. But what that approach has forgotten, did forget and is, is that the worker ads have hearts beating in their chests and souls that scream for expression. So what did we do our Celtic spirit? We shoved it right down. We put our unwed mothers in homes out of sight. Not just in Ireland, by the way, all over the world. I met a man a few weeks ago in, uh, by a stream in Cornwall, thanks. <laughs> and he talked about how he was, he was black, and I asked him, how did you get to be in this part of the world? And he said, well, my mother was a local girl. And my father was a black American sto soldier stationed in this part of the world. And back then the government took the young black babies off the mothers and put them away out of sight. So it's not just our issue. So somewhere along the line we forgot that we're a hard people. On that education system, we are the most educated people of our generation. We're the most educated people in the history of our state. And yet... Consider this, we are the most medicated. 
the most medicated people in the history of the state is today. Why is that? If you look at our, I'm from Clare, a six-year-old woman drowned herself in a quarry in Clare last weekend. Why is this happening? My specific passion is young people. I love them because their potential is so real and ripe. And they don't even see the beauty that's inside them. Look at the levels of suicide in our young. Now I'm an optimist, so I'm going to switch quick, very quickly to that. But why have we such a level of dis-ease in our young people? Where they're so lost that they try and lose themselves in alcohol or drugs or porn because there's 11, 12 year olds viewing it or whatever it may be. I believe it's because somewhere along the line, our education system became so good at educating the head and we've produced incredibly intelligent people along the way. And we've progressed to where we're able to be here tonight and understand wonderful speakers. But somewhere along the line, guys, we forgot to educate the heart. That piece of us, that intangible, we forgot to educate our hearts. The Dalai Lama, it was Rory McKeown that sent it to me, and I love it, a little quote, where he said, in the Western world, we spent 2,000 years exploring outer space, how to accumulate security or stuff. And in the Eastern world, they spent the same number of years exploring inner space. Now, that cycle you mentioned, Yvonne, my father that I mentioned earlier on, he worked in the buildings nine, up to nine months before he died from asbestos-related lung cancer. And that morning that I asked him, why are you doing this, Daddy? It was that which he was going out to do. The reason I cycled that bicycle was probably out of grief. It was an incredible journey. It proved to me that we have so much untapped potential that we never, never really dig deep into. We never realize. The one thing you forgot to mention, Yvonne, is that I met my wife on the last day of that cycle. So I did very well, didn't I? I came back in 2008 from Canada. I came from this bubble where we felt anything was possible. There was 200 of us, and we worked on creating it to where we wanted the whole world to hear about it. And I came back in 2008, and I turned on my radio, and I'd be so concerned. What is this doing to our young people's permission to dream? That they would be paying off the debt that they never signed up to for hundreds of years. That they'd be the silent victims of something they didn't create. And I said, that's not good enough. I might have a little light, but by Jesus it's going to shine. And I'm not going to stand for that. And then I went to bed. And the next evening, a documentary came on the radio or sorry, on the television, called Every Heart Beats True. It's about a man called Jim Steins. I'd recommend, if you haven't seen it, try and see it. He was a wonderful Irishman, and for 16 years up until his death, he created an organization for young people in Australia called Reach. And I watched that documentary with Kira on the couch, and we were both in tears. And there was a section in it where it shows him working with young people. And whatever's happening, they're telling him what he means to them. So all the young people are telling him what he means to them. And he bursts into tears. He weeps like a child. And I said, whatever that guy did for those young people, I'd love to find out more. A friend of mine called Carl Swan and I traveled to Melbourne on a wing and a prayer, went into reach, asked for their assistance. We walked up to the desk and we said to the girl behind the desk, the young people of Ireland need what you have. The poor girl almost lost her life. But she brought us inside and we met the CEO and we told Jim, we promised him on his deathbed what we were going to do. We were going to bring it back to Ireland and we created a SOAR. So what is SOAR? This is for you, Yvonne McCarthy. What SOAR is... <laughs> what, what SOAR is, it's all about inspiring the, the next generation to take ownership of their lives. To take ownership of their lives. But for, for me, I suppose it's something different. It's something a little bit more deep. It's an answer to a world that tells you to put away the positive shite. That will never work out. Tone it down. 
Be a round peg and fit in a round hole. And be a ch don't be a child any longer. It's time to grow up. For it is that sentiment that has us walking around like zombies. Half alive. Awaiting the next government to give us sustainable happiness. Or giving our power away to anyone or anything. Asking with them. Pleading. Take away the fear. So, I'll tell you two, about two or three young people. Because this is where, this is definitely going to be something I want to spend a few seconds on. How long do I have actually? Four minutes. Oh, brilliant. So, <laughs> I want to tell you about where our young people are. Okay, and I am no, no um, expert on this. By no means am I an expert. I'm just telling you about the schools all over Ireland. We've been to nearly every school in Donegal. Tell you about some of the hundreds of brilliant young people we've met. And I'm going to be very honest with you. Our young people are very, very lost. They inhabit homes where their parents invested their lives in a system that has failed them. And they feel this. They talk to us about being up in their rooms and hearing mom and dad talk about it. Go back up to your room. It's grand. Everything's okay. But it's not. And they know it. They're very lost because they live in a virtual world that many of us don't understand. It's like the Lord of the Flies. They go into this world and there's no rules. There's no one to protect them. And when they go home from school, the bully follies them because it's on their handheld device. So they're in this war with a world that they're trying to come to terms with. And their parents are so traumatized, they can't fully help them. And our teachers are doing their best, but they're under massive, massive pressure. Let me tell you about some of the brilliance of our young people and why I believe in them and why I'm so delighted to be here. And I'm so optimistic. We brought four 15-year-olds to Canada last summer. One of them was a girl called Emer Lynch. Her mum and dad fled the troubles in the north to live in County Clare, wouldn't, wouldn't we all, <laughs> to give them a better life. And we brought Emer. And one of the talks at the camp in Canada was by this fellow who'd been horrifically bullied as a teenager. He had his ribs broken for wearing a pink t-shirt to school and being called gay. And the following day, he said to his classmates, let's make a statement. Let's all wear pink tomorrow. Everyone in the school wore something pink except the four bullies. This went virally across Can Canada and became known, known as Pink Day. Emer Lynch was so moved by that story, she came back to her teacher. Now, remember, she's 15. She went into her teacher and she said, sir, there's bullying in this school, and you're not doing anything about it. So we are. We're going to have a pink day. And he said, a what? Well, a week later, every single student, including the teachers, walked around Killaloo in pink. Now, that's the power of a 15-year-old when she's ignited. We're in, in a school in, in Wexford, and we're talking about difficult times. And the guidance counselor, we always have one in the room, starts talking about how his brother-in-law had taken his own life, left behind a year-old baby, and how it really devastated the family. And he broke down and he wept in front of 125 boys. And when the biggest strapping lad near the back of the class stood up, turned around and says, Jesus, sir, fair fucks to you. <laughs> That's how real it was. The following week, he rang me. Sorry about the language, Joe. The following week, he rang me. And the teacher, and he said, you won't believe what happened. I said, what? One of the students came up to me and said, look, sir, I've been having suicidal thoughts for six months. And when I saw your courage, I said, it's not a weak thing to ask for help. How do I get help? That's what happens when you ignite a young person's heart. The last story is, is very special to me because it's a Donegal story. We went to school in Donegal, and a girl came up to me afterwards. And she's like many of the teenagers that I meet has something she wants to do, but perhaps doesn't yet have the confidence to realize her potential. And she wanted to be a writer. And I encouraged her just to apply for some writing competition. Just give it a go. See how it goes. And she emailed me the following week to say that she'd entered a competition. It was called the Cadbury's Young Journalist Award, GEA run competition. That was fine. I forgot about her. I didn't think about her again for a few weeks because we were quite busy that time. And then she rang me back to say, just want to let you know, I won it. Her name is Miriam. She's here tonight. She's from Donegal. She's one of your own. Now she's been offered jobs. She rang me the other day just to let me know that she's been writing columns for a local newspaper. And they've asked her when she leaves school, would, would she come work for them? 
That's what happens when you ignite a young person's heart. So, in conclusion, thank you, Joe, for the opportunity. What I would say is, we are the guiding elders of this society. Our young people are yearning for the opportunity just to get a chance. And I'm telling you, the recovery of this country does not rest in Kildare Street. It rests in our hands. Human beings have, an, and I do it as, many, as much as anyone, an unbelievable tendency to find excuses. What I would say is, take ownership of this country and let's guide our young people. Let's guide them. And this is how we're going to guide them. What would you have wanted for yourself, looking back at your 15-year-old little you? Or what would you wish for your son or daughter, or a granddaughter, or a grandson? What would you wish for them? But really, what would you wish for your 15-year-old self? Take that home with you. At some stage in the next week when you're doing whatever floats your boat, out walking the dog, or whatever it may be, just reflect on what would I want if I was to travel back in time and I was to give a piece of advice to my 15-year-old self, what would it be? And then let's gather together. Let's really believe in our young people. Let's take ownership of that. And with them, let's go and change this country and not wait for someone else to do it for us. Thanks very much.